Welcome back, everybody, to our third and final day of our 39th annual conference here at the Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness, our first fully online one. This is your president, Andy Gervich, speaking to you on our third morning. And I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon. I'd like to start as we have every session with a land acknowledgement. Portland, Oregon rests on the traditional village sites of tribes, including the Multnomah, the Kathlamet, the Clackamas, the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapua, the Malala, and many other tribes and bands. As the original caretakers of this land, we wish to begin by acknowledging their presence, their dignity, their continued struggle for respect, for restoration and reparations. Uh, I am here because they were here first. We are here able to speak with you today from this space because they were here uh, and displaced to a large extent from this land. And so it's the uh, a desire of this organization and of me personally to do what we can to help rectify that. One way is by uh, really attending to inner transformations and taking so much of what we've learned and shared with each other over this weekend and making sure that it's uh, moving down into the body and that we aren't just uh, in a cognitive space of receiving, but that we're also uh, in a place of integration and of uh, being sensitive to uh, the, the very powerful and also very subtle energies that have been moving through and in and inhabiting this conference. And so uh, this morning's session is absolutely geared towards that. This is a slightly different setup than some of the other um, sessions we've been in. Everyone is here because we want to have some interactivity and we're going to be doing some breakout rooms and things. And so you are all in just a regular Zoom room that probably looks a lot like what you remember and have experienced in other Zoom meetings. And so if you could do us a favor um, and make sure that you stay muted. Um, if you have questions or comments, please go ahead and put them into the chat. There will be a time uh, for group sharing and, and participation a little bit later. And we'd like to still manage that because of the, the amount of people that will be in the session, um, mostly through the chat. Um, and there will be a time if you want to speak directly to Gertrude or others where that will be, uh, uh, we'll make that available as well. And we are going to do some small breakout sessions where you'll be speaking to one another. But during the main session, if you can please keep your microphone muted, uh, that would help eliminate any uh, crosstalk noise that would uh, sort of disrupt the session. <clears throat> Excuse me, as far as your camera, um, that's up to you. We are also broadcasting this to our Twitch channel. Um, and so if you, uh, two things, if uh, bandwidth becomes an issue and things are becoming glitchy, maybe uh, kill your camera uh, for the time being until you go into the breakout rooms, because that would help a little bit as well. And if you'd like to maintain privacy and not have your image and name broadcast out onto our Twitch channel, uh, you might want to think about that as well. But your camera being on is optional for you, but we do request that you turn your microphone off for now. Um, there is a live captioning button um, on the bottom right, that is, uh, or not all the way on the right, it's kind of in the middle of your screen. If you um, would need captioning services and you would benefit from those, um, and that would make the panel more accessible to you, then please do click on that. Um, as we talked about Marjorie yesterday, these captions are not perfect. They're 80 to 90% perfect and can sometimes be extremely distracting. And so if you find them distracting, go ahead and leave them off as well. Since we are in a, um, a Zoom room, um, you actually do have the capacity to change your name. And so we'd like, if you'd li uh, like to, um, please keep your name uh, as close to the name you registered with uh, so we can do control of security for the room. But if you'd like to go ahead and add your preferred pronouns to your name as well, you just have to click on the right next to your name, that more button, and you can rename yourself and add that. Okay, now to our session. Uh, so excited to have Gertran Singh Khalsa here with us. I'd like to introduce him briefly and then we'll jump right into it. Um, Gertran going to guide us in a simple but powerful uh, breath meditation to bring us into the stillness, the presence of stillness and joy, and then connect us with our own hearts and with all of nature, of which we are always a small but essential part. Then he's going to share ideas on personal embodiment, stillness, and the nature of becoming that show we are deeply connected to one another and to the entire cosmos. Through his own experience, the experience of others, and these meditative techniques, he will reach joy, help us reach joy, stillness, and presence, and perhaps remind us of how we need to connect to nature in a time when so many of us feel disconnected. Um, I'm gonna give you a brief bio about Gertrude and then a personal anecdote, and then we will shift it over to him. Gertrude Singh Khalsa, PhD, is an affiliated scholar at Chapman University in Orange, California. There he collaborates with the Institute for Quantum Studies on projects from leading edge applications of quantum foundations to the nature of consciousness 
and our ability, or excuse me, our capacity as human beings. He has worked with Chapman's Fish Interfaith Center since 2013, contributes to original research and meditation, breath and wellness. He's developed several global training programs in meditation and its application to leadership, wellness, and personal transformation. He's the premier trainer for practitioners of the yoga of awareness since 1969. He's authored and uh, advocates for breath, for breath walk to integrate meditation, walking, eco immersion, and uh, engagement with nature. He's written a wonderful book called The 21 Stages of Meditation uh, that you should check out. We'll drop a link to that in the chat later uh, as to his site, gertrand.com. Um, and just to say on a personal note, he's been a, a dear friend and a mentor of mine for the past 10 years. He has been intimately involved with this organization. Some of you who joined earlier heard Richard Choquette mention his affiliation with the organization and speaking to us at a conference at CIHS, which was put together uh, and inhabited by Richard and uh, Brian uh, Rill, our former president. Uh, Gertrude has had such a profound influence on Brian's life as well. And so the past you know, 10 years of this organization and its leadership uh, and its direction and its focus um, have, have been infused with the, the wisdom and the, and the compassion uh, and the joy that Gertrude brings uh, to the table. And, and it's absolutely shaped the, and changed the course of my life and changed the course of the direction of this organization, both with myself and with our former president, uh, Dr. Brill. And so uh, I thank you for being here, so, sir, and I appreciate your friendship and leadership so much. And with that, we are going to turn it over to you, Dr. Gertrude Singh Khalsa. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you said it all. <laughs> of course, I prefer to under promise and over deliver. <laughs> but in this case, it's actually each of us that are delivering for ourselves. It's kind of an experiential sandwich where we have one type of experience that we'll start with uh, in just a couple of minutes, which is a meditation that, well, make your own experience. That's what it's for. But uh, throw yourself yourself in and put aside whatever else is going on and all those lovely thoughts that all of us have in very deep and lovely and precise ways and just as we say immerse immerse into it and let the immersion itself evolve a kind of experiential vocabulary in you afterwards we'll go and we'll have a few words have you extract a few phrases i think it's an honor uh, to share. And it's an honor to share these few things that I will. But it's exciting. My core thing is always, it is amazing to have awareness. It's a gift that we all share breath. I probably taught a million people or so over the years, many years, <laughs> you know, for, in Latin America, from the tip of South America, the top of North America, Europe, Asia, all over the place. One thing we definitely share, breath. We don't have that, the conversation doesn't progress. But since it's so fundamental, the teeniest change in breath, the slightest change in pattern, the engagement of awareness with that can create a profound adjustment inside. So if you want to bridge the inner and the outer, the inner ecology and the outer, if you want to be and dance at the borderland between the global and the local, Breath is a lovely way, a fast ramp to make a shift. So it doesn't take <clears throat> years and years of practice. Years and years of practice are recommended. <laughs> but I've always wanted to find something that uh, matched the time we're in. We have many transitions, as people have said. What's different is we're connected. The tribes can reconnect across time, people across the world. Importantly, we're having breakthroughs in the science side in many ways. And all these different uh, types of breakthroughs are starting to talk and be in the same room and it's accelerating everything. So as we open the keys to life and genetics and all of that, we have to equally open the keys to the heart. When these two come together, then I think many of the visions that people here have expressed and that I'd love to hear in the conference uh, will progress the best they can. We can't force it but we can be it and then we can be with the flow. So that's my orientation for today. And I'll show you a slideshow, uh, nine slides, not too many, that give you kind of a core idea of how nature itself has awareness. We have the awareness. What is the dance? What is the rhythm between them? So let's explore it together. So we're going to start 
with an actual meditation. We're going to breathe and the breath is going to be through the nose, like in equal segments, as I'll describe in the video. And just throw yourself into the space that happens. And then we'll go into the breakout room, share for a few minutes what the experience was, and then we'll go on from there. So if we could cue up the first meditation, let's all do it together. Here we go. We all need a little joy and energy during this time. And there's a lovely thing using breath work. Breath work is powerful, especially if you combine it with a sense of focus and pattern, and then take that with movement. So pattern, focus and movement. And when you do that, you start becoming aware of your patterns. And in fact, you can repattern your patterns. So here's a simple example of the power of a breath work and how it can apply it to you in your day. It opens the gate of the heart and for joy. You can do this in nine minutes. You can repeat the nine minutes if you like twice. Just keep it in the sequence. So I'll show you what it is. Uh, we're going to do a movement that looks like I, I call it catwalk because it's funny. It's like a cat. So you move your shoulders a little like swimming, but kind of like cats. So we do eight beats this way, inhaling in eight segments. And then we exhale through the mouth for four beats. And then hold for one, hold for one, and then begin again. We repeat that pattern, that's focus, breath pattern, and movement. Then we switch and we bring all the results of that with a very simple, calming hand position, hand mudra. Relax in front of the heart with the thumbs up. And then you simply keep the eyes a little bit open looking down and listen to the music that just lets you glide yourself along. After we focus on that way, mindfully present, noticing what's happening, then we relax even further, relax your hands down into the lap or on the knees. And then we change the music again, where you allow yourself to feel spacious, connected, the aliveness of life flowing through you as you open up that gateway to the day to be your best self in your most elevated self. Let's do it together. Here's how we start. So you hear the music. Begin.
Now just inhale and then as you exhale, bring your hands in a simple lock. First joints, thumbs up and bring yourself to your heart. Eyes a little open looking down and just meditate here at the heart. Calm breath. Listen to the music, pay attention to your heart, become present and very mindful of your sensations, your senses, your energy. Continue to meditate as you've come into your heart, into your center. Let your hands relax into your lap, over your knees. And let yourself expand. 
Let yourself just drift, open, open to the world, handshake between you and the world flowing together. Meditate calmly, go deep and go far. And now at the end, and consolidate all that you've gained and all that you've changed. Inhale up. Turn left and right. And exhale. And one more time. So in about nine to 10 minutes, you can, in fact, repattern. You can refocus and you can uplift and you can open up the gateway of the heart to feel a little bit more joy, a little more aliveness and a lot more intention to the patterns that you create each day. You can repeat that twice. So about nine minutes, nine minutes, 18 minutes, a little relaxation, 20 minutes, something to help you. I look forward to sharing with you much more about breathwork and the amazing effectiveness of that, especially 
of all the different kinds of breaths that we can use and all the different patterns that we have. A special one called the master breath. So you can really learn how to easily shift, even a short time in your day or longer practice if you want to go deeper and further. Kacharan at kacharan.com. Have a great day. You know, I think that uh, this conversation of what do you call intersectionality uh, really makes my heart uh, sore. I always think that the change happens the most kind of at the boundary. You know, there's a, a boundary in ecologies and a lot of uh, change happens there. There's a boundary in dialogue where we earnestly come together across our particular bubbles of the world and we seek to ask, what is the right question? And then we don't just pose the question when we are at a certain dance between these two areas in the boundary, we allow the question to reveal itself. We can't get beyond frames and have no mind moving or anything else, but we can create a moment. Reminds me of uh, Viktor Frankl, a psychologist, when he said, well, between stimulus and response, there's always a point of stillness in which we have a choice, we have a freedom, we have an experience of enacting our free will and embodying that sense into our action in the world. Or, you know, or another poet, Rumi, uh, Rumi, who has almost a love relationship with that which is beyond, talks about it as a guest coming in and then embodying into the heart and into our life. So there's a sense of livedness, of aliveness while being alive. Because being alive is not a big deal. You're alive and then you're not. But at each moment, you, can, you and I can experience aliveness. There's something about that that brings out our greatest creativity, our ability to listen, our ability to connect and, and even to merge, to feel at least, that we are joined in a way that I don't make a list of, I don't just categorize. And for that moment, it's a very precious thing. So this first meditation, I see in your chat, say, yes, energy is moving. There's a place, it's about flow. And sometimes we don't flow as well because things are out of balance. We're too busy in our mind. Some would say meridians are blocked, different ways of thinking about it. And then we come to a place where we suddenly shift that. And at least for a moment, we put our toe into that boundary between the local and the global, between the personal and the vastness. And they're not fighting each other. These things exist like a jazz band of infinity. Jazz of Kundalini, we used to call it. Kundalini just means awareness. So awareness, in my experience, has a kind of special place, but it's not just contained in the neurons. It's part of nature itself. And that has fascinated me since I was the tiniest little kid. In a farm in Canada with my grandmother who emigrated, escaped actually from the purges in Russia. We would sit there and she'd say, fly with the crows. <laughs> and I would immerse in the nature from that small time to later. When I was walking in the woods of Oregon, when I was in the labs of engineering and school and mathematics, the beautiful pleasures, the poetry that comes from mathematics and the way it plays and combines and allows uh, incredible experimentation. I always remember the outer lab is necessary to share something like we saw in that beautiful film of gathering. You can see little footprints of the way change happens so that we can understand it in an external way and share it. But also, we have an equally valid internal experience, trillions of intersections between our neurons, billions of primary neurons. All of these things create a, a dance. So the goal for me is not to reach an attainment that's far beyond, to go some other place. I find that what is awareness and who we are is in some sense, both right here with feet on the ground, in our culture, in our time, in this family, and at the same time everywhere. 
and nature itself shows that same signature. So beyond any particular philosophy, tradition, metaphysics, and that, there is breath, there is the energy and flow. So that's what these two meditations are that we're doing today, to give you a comparison and ask you to explore that for yourself and to see uh, what you can learn and what we can share in these two experiences. So I think what I'd like to do with our time today and to solve your time is to go actually to a slideshow. It's only eight slides, so it's not too long, but it'll give you kind of a core idea. When I say the real gift of being alive, the gift of infinity of God, whatever you'd like to say, is this ability to have agency and the ability to have a choice. Just don't imagine you control everything. <laughs> You're in a dance, in a relation, in a stream, in a lineage. We're in a certain moment. So whether you go to a philosopher like Jasper, who says there are axial moments where the entire context of the way we're interacting changes. We're here. I, I think I would just say I am an intersexuality in between this and that. One of my roles at Chapman is exactly that, to go between the quantum physics, uh, the interfaith center, the sense of psychology, the neuroscience. Hard to do because our stories and our labels are very different when we get deep into any expertise. So we need an ability to get to a stillness and to understand the nature of each of our minds and our tendencies. And then we can share in the most profound and beautiful way. <laughs> it's like love. When you finally see someone eye to eye, lips to lips, in love, there's a process in which you kind of forget yourself and then you come back out. And yet there's a uniqueness to that self that always uh, abides with us. So let's take a look at this uh, slideshow. This is just to introduce and say that besides breath being universal for me, there is a dynamic between what I'll call parts and holes. Holes are irreducibles. And if you in tune to this, you can find a perspective in exploring it, both with meditation and in the labs in physics, both ways. We're starting to gain a new perspective on nature itself, the nature of nature, and how we're all connected. So this is why we're going to kind of try this uh, breath work we just did. And went on the second one, call, I call it a master breath because it adjusts you into a beautiful way, your nervous system, your cognition, and it goes into the dance between the parts and the holes. And that really, it gives you an ability to feel healing, intuition, joy, uh, even prosperity, because you continue to make wise choices and to finally realize not just the, what, let's call it the true self and the heart where you sense your personal self, but also your unique self. So if I go to the next slide. Here I'm saying, look, our intuition is there that we have a profound connectivity and holism. Next slide. Next button. <laughs> but mostly from trying to go between the intersection of science and shared things we can look at together. Um, and each other, science is, as many people here have said, starts by saying, wait a minute, mostly we reduce things into parts and then we reconstruct them. So a cloud is a bunch of molecules and dust and water, and we can make a very good model from that. You know, reductionism has its day and has a lovely use, actually. On the other hand, if only you study things by sampling them, engaging them, breaking them apart, breaking up an egg and just staring at the shells, you might never know there's a chicken. <laughs> it takes time to evolve that. And so we're usually told, well, you can't even sample. You can't sense anything without disturbing it. True, that's one way. That's called a von Neumann measurement, a hard measurement. It's a hard way of sensing. It's coming up to your love at the end of the day, full of lists. You've got a list. Oh, you're introvert, you're extrovert, you're this, I have that to do. That's like a hard measure. It's a sample that puts us in a certain constraint like we've been talking about. 
So in science, that was pretty much the way we've made amazing discoveries. But now, next, there's a change afoot. This is where we've been. You can see all the local little blue microscopic parts. It can be parts inside of us too, but this is uh, parts we can experience outside. And those push themselves up into that larger hole. So we make a, an emergent hole out of the complexity in the interaction between all of our parts. Next. But what we now have discovered is we actually have ways to measure that do not disturb the system enough to break it apart. And we can measure it again and again. So there is an ability to say, wait a minute, there is such a thing as wholeness, a whole, a state, a situation of wholeness that is literally not breakdownable, not uh, able to be described by any collection of algorithms from parts. And that sense of holism is something very new. Intuitionly, from whitehead philosophers all the way to the Greeks, there's always that intuition in us. But to be able to actually find it and share it in the science, that's new. That started in the 60s. So from Einstein and Bohr to Bohm, uh, Yakira Haranoff, uh, Jeff Tollickson, there's a whole, oh yes, a lineage through time that has finally found a way to start bridging these ways. And that is an amazing thing. Next. And that's what we're seeing here. The whole, as a whole, without breaking it down, actually can influence across all the parts at once. In parts, it takes time, like squeezing a toothpaste tube, you know, squeeze it from here to here, move this meridian to here. But there's another thing, another process that's absolutely natural. We all have it. You don't get it in a special place, except maybe realizing it in the dance of your heart. So next slide. So along with this comes this idea that everywhere we go at all scales, there is this kind of image we use of a yin yang, where they're complementarity. It's not one or the other, it's not a fight. There's a kind of a dance and it makes up our experience and our capacity to sense both the local and this global. And in that dance, we get awareness and a sense of self in the real sense. Next. There we go. So now I just showed in the back of this, we were talking about the yin and yang, the two parts here that we're looking at is the bottom up wholeness, bottom up into wholeness and wholeness down. Next. So this is a static image of that same process where you can see kind of on the light side over there, the one that we can easily see like when the lights are on, that's the action of the parts, the forces, our roles, uh, all the particulars that are beautiful to attend to, we can get that. Our senses help us do that. And yes, we play with our senses and we have all the illusions, of course. We learn how to handle that conversation with our parts. And then on the right side, they're kind of dark. <clears throat> you know, whoops, go back. And you see there the dark, it doesn't mean bad or this, or, it just means unseen. Because a lot of these processes of the whole don't speak or show up in the same way that it does when we're in our parts. There's a different sense of uh, experience of language. A lot of times when we kind of merge into that wholeness, we say we've left that self or our perspective behind. We just merge, call it gnosis. I tend to say that in that stage, when we're fully merged, I just call it sentience, like a readiness to be aware, but you're not conscious, not in the way you are when you are conscious of something over in the parts conversation. And so sometimes you put aside the things and you merge, and then there's this rhythm. And the rhythm is the key thing that creates the most powerful meditations that I know uh, and allow access to that in an easy way and give us an access to the heart. Now here you see a yellow all the way around. Well, what's on the line between the two sides of most yin yangs? And what surrounds the whole process and holds the dance? 
the beautiful dance that is in nature, in life, in our heart, in between you and I, when we're in a state to connect and, and do it with compassion and with love. It's awareness. Uh, the old word Kundalini, where I taught widely, uh, just means awareness. It's your awareness. It's natural. So it's different than consciousness. It's a different function. <clears throat> awareness can allow you to hold multiple states same time. In the quantum world, that's hard because if you have one, you have another, and then you look, you collapse into one. That's the idea. But with awareness, you can actually have what I would call, you know, a virtualization. I don't just mean digital imagination. There is an ability to capture a sample of your own self through time, each moment, where the future is totally not determined. You can't control it, but you can engage and help create with it. So that's where this is here. This is the dance that gives us awareness. All right, next slide. This is such a profound thing. Thousands of years, we've never been able to actually measure wholeness and find out it's dynamic through time with the parts. So that's what we call a paradigm shift. <laughs> Kuhn has talked a lot about that and the social aspect. And here I'm just saying, look, for a big shift like that, at least in science, you have to have new measures, new questions. You have to find paradox and love them <laughs> because it's you asking nature a question and the response coming. So in my world, I love being full of paradoxes because then it looks like the miracles occur. And yet in the end, we find this is a constant process. So how do we let go of that old mindset? Uh, what we call this new perspective from the science side is the becoming picture of nature. And this little bit of breath work that we're doing is to enhance your ability to be on both sides of the yin yang, to be in yourself, to allow not just a flow of things, but a flow of the self in an era of, in a pathway, let's call it of meaning. I uh, can even call it destiny. Now, some of us do hide from paradigm shifts. It does create a lot of changes in business and this and how we look at it. We have to be a little humble about that. I'm like the chick on the right though. I love paradigm shifts. Maybe that's my paradigm. I love paradigm shifts. All right, the next slide. Uh, so this is just a simple way. The, the key thing here is cosmic rhythm, one that's in, in ourselves and in the total universe. And when we have that rhythm, uh, when we're not too noisy, but we engage it fully both in the body and in our actions, in an intuition. We have a rhythm like you see in that little infinity sign there. So when we're dealing on the left side with parts, then we create context. Context can become a role. They're part of the container in cultures. So there's a tremendous ability, a huge sensitivity we have. If we're on stage or we're watching the stage, we feel completely different. Our context is there. Or as one person said, you go into the courtroom and you want to decide what sentence should be given here. And you smell a bad smell. It's a classic experiment. You're, you change. The context impacts you. Now, that's important. And that's part of the play that happens there. But maybe in the part you get a goal or a focus, and then you give it over into the whole. You go for a moment and you merge. You start to allow, you can call it non-local, you can call it merger sentience. You go into the aspects of yourself, which are always here, the wholeness. When you enter that, oh, sometimes we have wonder, merger, different emotions that invite and signify that. And then we can come back into a kind of manifesting in the dance. And that's in yoga, we'd say it's at the heart. The heart has a triangle up and a triangle down. The emerging parts of the whole and the whole coming into here. So we say oftentimes it meets at the heart. We feel who we really are, that's the self. Then we have an increased ability, awareness, alignment, agency. Next slide. So that's that same infinity, that dance that goes on, that rhythm. And I just wanna emphasize on, on this. So there's two ways of observing in science. One is a strong observation, the guy with the hammer over there, <laughs> breaking the egg, waiting for something to happen. And then there's the gentle one who doesn't disturb it, leaves the egg until the chick comes out. 
So we have this thing, uh, Yakira Harnoff is really the one who initiated that and showed how we can sample through time in the present, the past, the future, and how they combine. And so we used to call that the atom of holism, you know, the whole, the first place in which uh, the irreducible can be experienced. When that happens, when these two parts dance together, these two complementary ways that we can sense, that gives us a dialogue with our own self. It's a beautiful place. And it creates awareness in the now. I capitalize now. It's like William James saying, more than just the present, you can have an extended present. There's an interaction that goes on. And we know that's true now, and we can actually measure that or we have a way to at least see its footprint. Next slide. So for me, this is my playful slide. <laughs> uh, you have on the bottom, the complexities that we always do. And this implies as we pay attention to it, that we have more somatic wholeness and somatic intelligence, body intelligence, and consciousness expands consciousness. And then we have wholeness top down when we have an increased ability to sense holes and to allow them into us at the self, that's stage zero. And then you just tend to grow. You go along, that's where we have stage one and two, but those aren't like boundaries. That's what I put at the top, stage infinity. This is the process of constant revelation where you don't really know, for example, your unique self, except as it reveals itself in each moment in all the contexts, it's not a fixed thing. So I call it here, awareness and destiny, growing in stages moment by moment, because we have free will to create, to sense a now, a whole interval through time and with others. And that's when we realize this thing I call a unique self. Next slide. And because in all of this, we're really asking our own nature and nature a question and trying to listen through experience. So there, to me, without experience, I don't believe in having a big concept without an experience. Experience can evolve in its own way and then we respect and we share. Click. And that handshake you just saw between the future and the past will lead us, I think, to new questions. How much can we actually sense? As uh, Mr. Schwartz uh, said in his experiment, how do we sense from the local and the, the non-local? How does that work? And even we can create now uh, new states of light, for example, that help bring in that sense of wholeness. There's an experiment, there's an experiment not published yet. We're able to take uh, a low order, like an infrared photon, and by a little clever manipulation, suddenly it interacts with its own uh, alternate states and produces a gamma ray. We go from one electron volt to a gigavolt. I mean, that's huge. Where did that energy come from? Well, it's a question everybody's exploring just now. It suggests that we have the local energy, but we have a kind of interaction with a, a different kind of energy from the whole. We can call it weak energy, but it's not weak. It just means the way we measure has to be humble. The way we connect is there. So to even think about it is interesting. Sometimes we can revitalize, uh, we can find these extra sources of energy, not just from adrenaline and Red Bull and all that, but from being in that subtle relationship with this dance. And then you can end the slideshow. Now, I obviously did not give you all the math and this and the ways of measuring and all that. That's going down with a whole lots of language in the science. But it's fascinating to me that this ability is here for us to be in this complementary sensing. Now, I was looking at our time. Looks to me like uh, we should go ahead. And I'm looking at anything you put there in the, in the chat, by the way. Um, and I think we should just go to this experience now, rather than me framing it anymore. And this second meditation uh, is a little bit longer, it's about 23 minutes, and will take you into uh, what I call putting pearls on the necklace. And we'll 
talk about that all together after you do the meditation. So let's try this second experience and find where it takes us. I want to share this excellent meditation sequence for you using the breath and in particular the master breath. And we'll take the energy of master breath and we will take it to three centers in the body. And your body knows when you pay attention to any one part where it is. It opens up in different ways. It responds immediately to simple attention. And that's what we're going to use in the three centers. And we're going to use um, movement. So we're going to simply bounce the arms so that they go down about 30 degrees and up like so, up and down equally as we do the master breath. So you can hear the, the sound is equal in and out. And then we'll receive. And each time we receive, we open up, we let go, we allow in, we don't try to grasp, we witness, and we simply expand in our wholeness without any particular direction, but just a sense of presence, being in your true self, and allowing that the, the things that cannot be spoken to come into you. So let's just do this together. It's a short uh, energetic set, and we use it with uh, music. So uh, let's begin. Move your hands up and down like two basketballs. Still closed, focusing through the brow, but feeling the navel area, and now you continue. Thank you. 
inhale deeply. Hold your breath briefly. And then let your breath go. Relax the breath and extend your hands like this, like you're receiving from all. Your eyes are closed. Meditate at the brow. Feel your hands. Feel the space around your body. And simply breathe meditatively and steadily. Very relaxed. for a moment. And then let the breath go and go back to the motion with the master breath. Along with the hand movements, make sure the breath is equal in and out. Chest is lifted and still. Cross your hands right over your heart center. Sit straight, feel the heart, and begin the master breath again.
inhale and hold the breath, suspend it, feel the heart. And then as you relax the breath, bring your hands out again in the posture of reception. Now just let go and expand, receive. You've opened up all parts of your body from the heart. Releasing all contractions, stress. So with your whole body and your whole heart, let in vaster and vaster parts of yourself, your body, and even the cosmos. Breathe slow and meditate. Once again, suspend your breath. And then let your breath relax and go back to the master breath. together like this and come up here to the brow point 
So the thumb tips touch the brow between the uh, between the eyebrows, palms together facing up. And as you focus there, continue the master breath. Suspend the breath and focus right at the brow point where your thumb tips are. Suspend the breath briefly. And then relax the breath and bring the hands back out. Once more, even more vast. You've opened all three centers, all parts of the body. Let the natural flow and energy now. Expand past the surface of your body, expanding out, including all those that you may love, all those that you're connected with, and then beyond and beyond.
inhale. Bring your hands into your lap. Let your breath relax. And simply notice now, mindfully. How did you shift in the body? Where are you right now in your stillness and presence? Please still. Notice what it's like to have pivoted your state, shifted, opened, so you can sense more subtly, more clearly. And inhale, stretch up. Turn left and right. And relax. Thank you for creating that experience together. Please put your comments and just take a moment to compare your own experience from the first experience to this one. Notice where you are and how those flow and what we can learn from those. So I can see from our host, we just have a few minutes, but I'll look on the uh, chat and if we have enough time, then you also can just uh, come in and ask questions. But here's a thought for you. Uh, when we get into that profound place of stillness and we're whole in our self and our heart, we have that freedom to make an action, a choice, um, to allow in. And when you create from that place, it's a kind of activism in itself because it's like a fractal. You actually can place a free will and a choice and a presence that ripples, you can call it through time and space at all scales. And that's the amazing thing about these new discoveries. It's cross scale. We always wondered, how do we get to the micro? Can we get to the macro? Question is, how can we not? How can we not be in the dance of these two? So this uh, meditation is part of uh, hopefully giving you some experience around that uh, depth in the way that we do it. I say, if you, if you flow, you'll glow. If you glow, you'll let go. And if you flow and let go, two good things, then awareness enters as a very special guest into the heart. So I'm really happy to be with you here as I explore the anthropology of the self and myself explores the anthropology of all. So if you have any comments, if there's any time left, please uh, make the comments. Uh, I'd love to hear and, or to read. Gershon, I'll start as people are gathering themselves and we're approaching 930, but I think we can go a few minutes over here just for a time of reflection and, and connection. And so folks are welcome to turn their cameras and mics on if they want or continue to post their thoughts in the chat. But I'll, I'll start with just a, 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 a thank you for leading us through that very calming and centering and, and in rooted time. Um, Nicole Torres, our journal managing editor, talks regularly about being a radical organization. And she says the word radical means rooted, rootedness. And so what, what a radical rootedness you've helped remind us of and bring us back to. And a, a question I have, and so deep gratitude for that, a question I have relating to your slideshow <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, the image of the, uh, the strong versus gentle observation and the hammer. I'm thinking about, um, you know, the repatterning and awareness. And in, in your book, you talk about, you know, one of the, the things is uh, the, in the third stage um, is getting us in touch with the transcendent self. And you've been mentioning these things uh, in the conversation. And uh, as a religious scholar, Houston Smith talked a lot about the differences. And this is um, for the sake of time, I'm simplifying this, but the difference between Eastern and Western um, 
um, experiences of ego. And he says that when the, when the, the, in the East, the ego has not been cultivated to be this massive thing. And so when one goes to study meditation, uh, the, the, the yogi, uh, the guru has a, a little hammer and they can just tap that uh, and, and then thing just breaks apart, right? And then one is, uh, goes through that, that, as you talk about in your book, that kind of disturbing and, and unsettling period of, of uh, entering into a place of non-ego. But in the West, our egos are, are these massive things that we've cultivated through the years. And so the, the guru hits it with that subtle hammer and nothing happens. And so you have to get the jackhammer out to, to break into that thing. So I just wonder if you can speak to a little bit about that, about in your experience working with different people in this concept of repatterning and centering on awareness and, and, the, and the different struggles we all have um, culturally, personally, and otherwise to get into that space and, and navigate the, the subtle versus the strong observational energies. You know, I think when we make our stories and we try to understand and we form language, right, word clouds, uh, then there's always a struggle. If you go back to when things were said, uh, there's the East and the West and, and then they shall never meet in between, you know, that never the twain shall meet except we are. Right. And sure enough, uh, we all have egos, even in the East, in fact, some big ones, and in the West, some big ones. <laughs> so I'd rather not think of them as polarized into isms or difference. I would just say this is a process. And it's, in that sense, it's very universal. Uh, some of the techniques everywhere, when I'm in Latin America with shamans, when I'm in India with yogis, when I'm here with quiet walks, when Thoreau walks through the woods and says, oh, I love to walk and become lost where there are no fences. And then when I return, I feel so much more in my heart. And he can write. This is a very universal thing. So yes, there is processes of letting go. But I would say the East and West happens in the West and the East and West happens in the East. And we ought to drop this idea that they're so separate. The culture is yes, yes, yes. We All we have are languages. When I went to one uh, gentleman, I was in India and uh, coming uh, into Northern India, and he invited me over after going to the Golden Temple, having a healing and immersion in the pool of healing. And he had just very sweet, so humble when he came up, talk about an aura, it was beautiful. And I could feel that invitation from his whole self. I couldn't deny the invitation. So I went to his house, he had almost no uh, monies or anything, very few things, right? So I wasn't going to a rich person's house. It was just a person, person, not rich, not poor, person. And I could tell that because of the manner in which he engaged authentically. And he took out a little um, berry that is said to be from a tree where Guru Nanak, who was a sounder in the Sikhs, uh, shook it and found that this poison fruit could be made sweet when he just touched it, took it, and gave it to his companion. And so there actually is a tree like that. This berry is from there. It's very precious. It's a gift given to the family. And he sliced that and he put it into small pieces. And along with uh, some good curry, we enjoyed the taste of that lineage, that moment in which awareness burst out in a simple fruit and became a story in that area. So I think we have this capacity to meet. And now, now is the time we need to mature as human beings. Now is the time we need to step forward and take care of the earth. Now is the time we have to take care of each other. Now is a special moment where we can place a seed that like a fractal goes all over and like a pearl it's contained and beautiful from all the irritations that we may face and make more and more moments of this so that the pearls of experience where our whole self is present with another in love and compassion in reality becomes a very long string of pearls. That's how I look at it. I'd love in our final minutes for some other folks to, to come on and maybe ask a few questions, but I'll, I'll ask this as a follow-up. We talked last night about another aspect of your pre uh, presentation about this interface between the the very particular and experiential and and the universal. Um, and one of the things we struggle with in anthropology is is, is are there universals? Are there anything? Is there anything that um, has a capacity that we can engage 
um, as fully human or as just uh, as aspects of this conscious matrix. And we talked about the breath as the interface between those two. And, and you said something very fascinating about, you know, regardless of if we practice Kundalini or Wim Hof method, or regardless of our thoughts on breath work, regardless of our thoughts on these things, we have breath. And I noticed today when I was doing these exercises, you asked about some things we noticed that regardless of my cognition, regardless of what I thought or was anticipating when I was doing this practice this morning, I was experiencing a transformation of consciousness. It was actually happening while we were doing it, regardless of what my precognition was about what my expectation was. And so can you speak a little bit about that, about the importance of breath as this, if not universal, as this really gathering uh, space entity. I know in the religions I study, uh, spirit, wind, and breath, both in, in the Greek and in the Hebrew, uh, the same word uh, for both of those. So can you maybe speak to the importance of that? Yeah, first, I agree, Andy. <laughs> but breath is obviously a universal, and it's lovely, because when I talked about the boundary, the breath is both conscious and unconscious, and we can very easily change it into a pattern. So the first pattern we did you know, an eight, four, one combination of a simple breath. And then the second one where we had the master breath at 120 beats a minute, <laughs> quite different. When you do the last one, I can look in instruments and see the change in uh, telomeres and getting, you know, more regenerated in heart rate variation, much faster, but more smooth internally so that we can sense and open the senses. These processes to me are very shared. It doesn't matter where you are and what culture, how you talk about them. And all the special knowledges that you learn by all the experiment within life and that culture, yes, of course, those are different, right? But the key thing is that even nature itself has the same complementarity. We're not separate from nature in any form or imagination of the word. We're not going anywhere except the vastness of this amazing thing. We've been seeing nature well, at least from the science side, through one side of the glass. Now with this sense in allowing in wholeness, it's like suddenly, whoa, from black and white to color. <laughs> and it's an amazing experience, you know? So, uh, and I saw Molly was asked, made the comment, you know, that is it natural when you get into deep meditation that sometimes you said, you know, image of the things just, just arise. They, she, worked, she said, conjure. Yeah. It feels like conjuring, it feels like a miracle because when you're in that space, you can't grab things. So you have to go, get yourself together, let go. <clears throat> and then you start forming a new relation to the mind and into you and your awareness. You become an active agent, someone gifted with this moment. And look, a teenager, they get the keys to the car, you know, <laughs> they've been wanting it, they're ready, they, they can go everywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's insurance <laughs> and there's other drivers. <laughs> So I think in the ways we mature and we're getting the keys to this planet and to our genes and to awareness, this is a beautiful time to connect, to form those pockets that weave together and to accept without any fear at all, the accountability that we each have in this moment. Oh, Sharon, much love. It's on, you have to mute, unmute yourself, Sharon how much I appreciated this and how glad and happy I am to see you, Guru Charan. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. We've worked long together. We owe each other another conversation soon. <laughs> it's wonderful to see the connection between you two. You've been together for a while. Uh, some great comments in the chat from Mark Flanagan, our co-organizer of, of this conference, that speaking about uh, having a transcendence moment as well, despite cognitions and not being aware of his cognitions fully and then his mind. And, and how active it can be. And so the, an awareness of our awareness is something that can come in this kind of practice, uh, an interesting feedback loop. I appreciated uh, Mark's comments when he was talking about yoga and his experience. Uh, you know, in 1970, when uh, there was a lot of woo going on, a lot of beauty, a lot of chemicals, a lot of stuff going on <laughs> back in the 60s. And people would talk about Aquarian Asian this. And I said from then, I said, listen, when we come to that profound a change, in all of us, in our context, in our ability to engage with each other. Uh, it'll be a time of massive polarity. It's not gonna be smooth at all. 
it's not you're going to some set heaven. People have an idea. We're going to some set place, a heaven, this, a stability. No, no, no. We'll okay. have a dynamic stability, a dynamic stability. And it's going to evolve in beautiful ways that we cannot predict. So you should be resilient. Have this capacity to have compassion where it should not be had. Have kindness where you forgot the word. Have a place where you can literally show up as, oh yeah, a human being. Hue, light. Mun means mind. Human, a, a light filling your mind with be in presence and ing, action. Human beings are glowing light of manifestation and action and we share that universally in our own ways that's the beauty of being human that's well said and i see mark shagoyan has popped in mark would you we're going to maybe close down the next three four minutes here we went a little bit over time but that's great uh, would you like to, to chime in and maybe help well, this, up? this is great i was gonna say last time i saw you your charn was in new mexico at summer solstice probably in 2010 or something but it's been uh, a while but yeah i, I, um, I, I I resonate with what you're saying about the Aquarian age, not necessarily being all, you know, uh, butterflies and light, that it's dynamic. I think that, you know, both of us having had the influence of Yogi Bhajan, that he framed it a way that isn't necessarily <laughs> how it's unfolding. But, uh, but yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I know people would say, once we get through this, we'll have 5,000 years of, you know, peace or something, right? Like in yugas, right? But listen, those are just, why do that? Someone said, well, but how do I go here, here? We have different ideas of how we are. I said, look, my, I have a really simple idea. I think the older I get, the simpler I get. Well, maybe complex with quantum, but generally simpler. And I think if you can be in your own heart whole, if you can recognize when you are or not, whatever exists or doesn't exist when you die will admit you with open arms. You don't need to figure it out. You need to figure yourself out a little bit and let that heart out. Yes, that's true. I loved when I saw the inauguration with uh, Biden, the man to the poet it was fantastic. Did you not think that? Mm -hmm. Yes. And watch when she pauses because of her history and she couldn't speak in the beginning and so on. She squints her eye. She'll go, she'll squeeze it, not blink. She'll go like that. Mm -hmm. And what she's doing, she's checking, am I in my whole heart? So she's got a rhythm, the dance they talked about with the cosmos, the dance and the yin yang. She showed it in an embodied way, which, which made her poetry reach so many hearts. And I'm sure if she continues that, she'll remember it very well for that. Okay. Oh, by the way, a shout out to Hargo, H E R G O. He was the brilliant musician who created the Master Breath music with me. And uh, it's available. Love it. Wow. Gocharn, I have a question and following up on what Mark is saying. Um, I agree with him. Um, I, I see us moving toward the Aquarian ideals in terms of the challenges on equality and the challenges against prejudice and all the things that have governed us. And that to me implies that those values are increasing. But I also think at the same time that the age of Aquarius is gonna be one of intense science and astrologers are saying that. And that in some ways, Star Wars, may, the movies may give implications of, <laughs> of what the future could look like. What do you think of that? <laughs> Star Wars or the whole uh, Well, not quite as, uh, with as much fantasy, but the idea that we're moving out and that there are that we will be doing things that we're just seeing in imagination now. Well, that's the beauty of our ability to imagine, you know, to mm -hmm. uh, imagine the unseen and to do that. When human, human beings can imagine and have an experience of a thing we call infinity, to be able to even to imagine a word like that or to sense or to model it is amazing that we can do that. So I think uh, we're going to have a pretty good time, but we always have groundedness, okay? So when they look at the genes and stuff like that of the astronauts who are up there the longest, you find that they, they express all these genes. They set a fish up. It's this incredible little fish. And when they looked at the fish and it orbited around, you know, and then they looked at it afterwards, it started expressing thousands of uh, little proteins and stuff from their gene adapting. And yet when we're up there in space right now at this point, we still can't control uh, the muscle uh, the calcium, the different things. You know, we're, we're deeply rooted, as we keep saying, in this. So when we go and uh, go to Mars and Moon and all this, uh, it, 
it's going to be an interesting way. I think we have to go with heart. I have to, we have to go with humility and we have to go with science. I'm very pro-science. I don't see any contradiction at all between science, not scientism, but science and the ability to observe that way and the ability we can observe inside and how they come together. I think this is a time of coming across the boundaries. So we're in a beautiful riptide that has a huge power to draw us deep into the sea. And this is a time that uh, I think anyone who feels that way should step up. And by the way, you certainly have, Sharon. Yeah, going with uh, from the uh, uh, Palestinians and, and the Jewish tradition and bringing the women <laughs> together across boundaries. I mean, you know all about boundaries. Gertrude, thank you so much for this. Uh, I just, again, couldn't think of, we couldn't have scripted a better way to, to sort of ground us and move us towards the, the, the close of this conference. Um, Sharon, Mark Shigoyan, Mark Flanagan, uh, Kia, others that have been present here, I see Evgina and so many others. Um, Jordan's great presentation, Marjorie, just uh, the presence of all these people to help sort of make this moment sacred and, and meaningful. Uh, Mark Flanagan says, blessings, Gertrude, thank you for sharing your presence this morning. Deep bows to you. I just wanna say, I greatly appreciate your natural outflow of joy and ease so happy and that really translated to us. And so thank you for sharing that with us and, and helping us to set the space and, and sort of designate the container towards that kind of awareness of our own awareness. Um, we're gonna be moving over to our other session now. Um, and I just wanna thank you all again for being here. Um, that starts in 15 minutes. Um, and that is a reading of a, uh, a text by uh, Stephanie Kane from Indiana University, and the text is an engineered tableau from the spheres of unintentional agencies that will be in about 15 minutes. Uh, and thank you all for rolling with the time change and the sort of fluidity of what it is to kind of enter these spaces together. I know, Sharon, it's been quite a bit and it's, <laughs> it's been wonderful to have you all uh, to, to just navigate that. I know, I know it's quite a lot. And happy new moon as well, Mark says. Blessings to all, and we'll see you shortly.